Our text is Genesis chapter 4. Before it was the title of a novel about the Trask family with the patriarch Adam Trask and his two children, Cal and Aaron, east of Eden was a scripture reference. It is in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 4. We will read from verses 1 through 16 of Genesis chapter 4. And as Dr. Lawson mentioned, it is our custom at St. Andrew's Chapel to stand as we read the Word of God, and you would likely need a break from sitting. So please stand with me as we hear God's Word at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, Will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel? your brother. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the Word of God. You may be seated. I feel like you've been asked, would you like the good news or the bad news first? And you said, we'll take the good news, because you just heard a sermon on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ under the umbrella of this great doctrine of election, and that is good news. But there's also bad news, and it's not my fault that you ate your dessert first And now you have to take your broccoli and cauliflower and hear the bad news. We are talking about the gospel, 
a helpful tool for the gospel is this wonderful little Dutch flower called the tulip. The tulip is the summation of the five points of Calvinism, and we are out of order of tulip. We should have started with the T, but no, we should not have, because tulip is a summation of a document that comes to us from church history called the Canons of the Synod of Dort, short for the city Dortrecht in the Netherlands. Dort was convened, the Synod of Dort, was convened to answer a problem reverberating through the churches, the Reformed churches in the Dutch lands, and that problem was known as the remonstrance. When you remonstrate, you are demonstrating, but with a lot more force. That's what a remonstrance is. And they were remonstrating against the teachings of Calvin. And the remonstrance consisted of five heads of doctrine. And this document was floating around in 1610 and throughout the 16 teens. And so a synod was called. And as a result of that synod was produced, the canons, one N, two Ns, that's the thing that goes boom, one N, that's what we have in church history, the canons of Dort. And the order of the canons of Dort is actually all tip. Election comes first. Unconditional election is the first head of doctrine. And as the great doctrine of unconditional election unfolded just before us tells us God's election is not conditioned on anything within any of us, and aren't we so thankful that that's true? It is entirely according to the pleasure, to God's kindness, to the pleasure of His will, to His unconditional love for His redeemed. In the order of Dort, next comes the L, limited atonement, but we'll have to wait till tomorrow morning for that because Ultip is not a word, and to me, Utlip sounds like a Dutch city. So I went with Utlip, and so we have unconditional election, and now we're going to talk about total depravity. Dort starts off telling us what Adam enjoyed. He enjoyed fellowship with God, and a true knowledge of God. And in one fail swoop, he forfeited all of it and plunged his posterity into the darkness of depravity. Dort continues, man after the fall begat children in his own likeness. A corrupt stock produced a corrupt offspring. Hence, all the posterity of Adam, Christ only accepted, have derived corruption from their original parent, not by imitation, as the Pelagians of old asserted, but by the propagation of a vicious nature. Therefore, all men are conceived in sin and are by nature children of wrath, incapable of any saving good, prone to evil, dead in sin, and in bondage thereto, and without the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit, they are neither able nor willing to return to God, to reform the depravity of their nature, nor to dispose themselves to reformation. Oh, miserable fall, the poet John Milton puts it. What was lost but the greatness of man's glory, a reflected glory, a borrowed 
glory, not an intrinsic glory like that of the triune God, but a reflective glory as His image bearer, obediently tending His garden, was lost at the fall. And so we have a corrupt offspring. The first offspring, of course, is Cain. When Adam fell, Adam turned on Eve. Do you remember that? The woman, she did this. And in case you don't remember, you gave her to me. The nerve of Adam. Adam turned on Eve, but Cain slew Abel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer tells us that this is not a fallen world. It is a fallen dash falling world. It's not a static world of fallenness. So tragically, it's exponential. And so while Adam and Eve bickered, Cain enticed his brother out into the field. And with the full trust of a loving brother and having known no other companions, and with the full resolve of surety that he could trust his elder brother at one point while they're in the field, Abel just turns his back to Cain. And it went according to plan, and Cain removed whatever instrument he brought with him, plunging it into his brother, taking his life. Murder one, premeditated, thought out beforehand, and deviously executed. There are a number of phrases that jump out to me as I look at this text. This is, after all, a beautiful piece of literature, this narrative of Genesis. As I alluded to before we read it, it captivated the mind of John Steinbeck, and so he wanted to write his own opening chapters of Genesis and set it in California as he told a tale of the unraveling of a family. First phrase that jumps out at me is that Cain was very angry. He learned this from his father, didn't he? The woman she made me do this, and you're responsible too. Now, we could look at these opening verses of Genesis chapter 4 and say, is God fair? Abel is with livestock and animals, and Cain is with the grains and the fruits of the ground, and so they each bring that which is their tending of their fallen garden, yes, but still tasked with the creation mandate to cultivate and to make something of this earth into a garden. And so they each bring of their labors and put them before God as a child brings home their work and puts it before their parent and says, what do you think? But we have an idea that this was not the sacrifice that God desired. That when Adam and Eve 
committed their deed, there was a slaying of animals. There was blood spilled because God had been offended. Theologians use the word propitiation. Don't let your modern translations of the Bible take that word out. If people don't know it, teach them, but don't remove it from our vocabulary. To propitiate means to satisfy the wrath of an offended deity. And in this case, it is the deity, the God of the universe. And so animals were slain, blood was spilled, skins were provided, and Adam and Eve were covered. Kippur is the Hebrew word, and behind it is the English word, atonement. And not only that, but as we learn later in the sacrificial system, there's something to the aroma of the sacrifice. And so as the fat portions of the animals were burnt, there was the pleasing aroma as a satisfaction for sin. And none of that is present in Cain's sacrifice. And so God rejects Cain's sacrifice. We know that Cain's heart is not right because of what follows next. to recognize that God created the world, to recognize that the very breath that I draw is a gift from Him precludes any notion whatsoever of my being angry with God. Think back to your own shame and embarrassment, my own shame and embarrassment of the times that I was angry at my parents. And yet, I owed them everything, didn't I? How much more is Cain's action of anger reprehensible? And so God warns Cain, a dangerous reality was unleashed when your parents did what they did. And that dangerous reality is a lion. Can you picture it? You're walking down the path and there's some sort of bush and hiding behind that bush is a lion. Ready to pounce, muscles tense, reflexes astute, and at the moment the prey makes itself known, the full force of that creature will come down upon it, and that is nothing like sin crouching at your door. O oh, Cain, do you know what awaits you if you continue in your rebellion against me? So Cain leads his brother to the field and he kills him. God confronts him again. You understand these questions from God in Genesis, don't you? He knows the answer. The intention of these questions is not for God to find out information. The intention of these questions, the questions initially to Adam and Eve, where are you? And now the question to Cain, where is your brother? 
These questions are not to supply information back to God. These questions are to drive home the guilt of the offending party. For them to articulate the deed and the consequence. Do you know we have here in Cain's response the first question, the first human question recorded in the Bible? And do you recognize the underpinnings of this question? Do you recognize the clenched fist shaking in the very face of God? M. I, my brother's keeper. Is not this the tragic consequence of sin? That not only we are alienated from God, cut off from God, but we are alienated from one another. And so brother turns against brother. Maybe some of you in this room experienced war. I've only read about it, seen it. The atrocity of war, of taking each other's lives, the heinousness of murder, and it all spins from this text. It all spins from that question. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, Cain, you most certainly are. And the moment you even ask that question, you took another step down. And the moment you ask that question, we took another spiral, didn't we? Right down the drain. It is a fully inhuman question. Am I my brother's keeper? Why did God invent us, create us, but for Him and for each other? Do you know there's a beautiful moment in Milton You remember your John Milton, don't you? Paradise Lost. Sounds like something Sinclair Ferguson would say. Do you remember your Milton? And then he would proceed to quote big sections of it. That's because he was educated in the UK and I wasn't. But there's a moment in Paradise Lost where Milton has Adam reach down to Eve and put his arm around Eve. And Milton's Adam says to Eve, arise and let us go, complaining and condemning no more. Condemned enough we stand, but let us in offices of love, so labor to ease one another's burden of woe. Is not that the human response in a fallen world? May I put my arm around you and ease your burden of woe. And Cain did not learn that lesson from his parents. But arise, brother, let me put my arm around you. Let me lead you into the field and do you harm. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord says to Cain, 
you will be punished for this. You will become a wanderer. That's one of my favorite Hebrew words. It's shagag. Does that sound great? It's an onomatopoeia. It sort of sounds like it is to shagag. It's a new dance. It begins with motions like this. I'm sorry, that was only for Dr. Lawson and his hand motion. The Greek equivalent of this word is planao. The Greeks named those things in the sky, planaos, planets, because they seemed to simply wander. Now, as astronomy progressed, we know that they wandered according to a pattern, but initially they were seen to simply wander. It's a word used to describe sin, and it's a word used to describe our sinful condition. There was a band in the 60s and 70s, they called themselves the Rolling Stones. They took that line from a Muddy Waters blues lyric. And in the blues lyric, Muddy Waters says, I'm like a rolling stone, wandering, wandering far from home. And in the 60s and 70s, this British band took that line and made it the youth rebel cry of revolt. Rolling stones, freedom. It means homeless. It means wandering. It means anxiety. It means that nagging sense that something is wrong. And so I wander and I wander. Cain's wanderings took him. And it's that final phrase that stands out to us. East of Eden. God's intentions for us were that we would stay, be in Eden, that we would be in His garden, that we would cultivate His garden, that we would have our help mate, and we would not bicker and complain about and argue with, but that in lockstep we would fulfill our covenant obligation before our Maker. And at the end of the day, when our work is done and the tools are in the garden shed, the Creator of all the earth would walk with us. This is not the picture that we have in Genesis chapter 4. In fact, the picture gets worse. Next comes Lamech. Lamech has two wives, Ada, Zila. Lamech also killed a man, and at the end of chapter 4, he calls his wives together. In my mind, I picture this becoming almost a campfire song of Lamech. In his arrogance, he's not only going to strike out against humanity, he's going to make a song about it. He's going to brag about it as if he were a mighty warrior, as if he were a man's man. And in the end, Lamech He's just a petulant child, a rebel, and in revolt before his God. Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed.
killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge is seventy-sevenfold. And our fallen, falling world continues. Did we not know, based on Genesis 3, that we needed a Redeemer? And if we did not know, based on Genesis 3, that we needed a Redeemer, we certainly know, based on Genesis 4, that we need a Redeemer. God, in His graciousness, gives Adam and Eve a little thread of grace in this tapestry of death and destruction, when at the end of chapter 4, God gives them another son. And so, Seth becomes a thread of grace and a fallen world. I'm reminded of the story of Naomi. We call the book Ruth. It's really about Naomi. Ruth is rather incidental to the picture. At the end, once she has the child, she turns the child over to Naomi. And Naomi names the child. Do you know how out of step that is with culture? The the man, the father, always names the child in these cultures. But this one is called Obed. Do you remember when the book of Ruth was written? Another dark time, wasn't it? The first words of the book of Ruth in the days of the judges. And if that weren't bad enough, there was a famine in the land. And into Naomi's family comes death upon death as the curse reverberates throughout her world and takes her husband and takes her sons and leaves her a most needy widow. And yet, into that situation is born a son. And the women of the village gather around Naomi and they say, a son has been born to Naomi, and he shall be her nourisher. It's a baby. It needs to be nourished. Do you not see the blessed irony of that? And yet Naomi's future is now secure because of that infant. And Obed had a son, and his name was Jesse. And Jesse had a son and his name was King David. And according to the Gospel of Matthew, many generations later, a man named Jacob belonged to that line, and Jacob had a son, and his name was Joseph. And Joseph was betrothed to the Virgin Mary, and there was a son And the angels appeared, and the animals made room in the stable, and the shepherds gathered to look upon the face of their Savior, an infant lying in the manger, this long ago promised seed. You see, we could read Genesis 4, and we could read the story of Cain and Abel, and we could read the story of Lamech, and we could say at the end, this is our family story. And that'd be true. But the story keeps going, and there's Obed and there's Jesse, and there's David, and there's lots of others, and there's Jacob, and there's Joseph, and there's Emmanuel.
And that's our family story. In Christ. Right, Steve? In Christ. Oh, we know what it means to be an Adam. It means death and destruction. It means bitterness, impulse to anger. It means devastation. We know what it means to be an Adam. We know that to be an Adam highlights, underlines, bold face type our need for a Savior. Adam turned on Eve, Cain slew Abel, and Lamech killed the young man. And such were some of you. Do you know what our problem is? Our problem is not that we have some crazy, eccentric uncle hidden away that we don't even want to bring out at family reunions. Our problem is that we are tied into a family tree that could be stamped across the top of it. Children under the wrath of God. That's what Paul tells us. It's in Dort, but before it was in Dort, it was in Paul. We are by nature children of wrath. That's our need. God did not abandon us, but God sent the seed. He sent the one the one who undid what Adam did, and the one who could do what Adam could not for us. He kept the law for us. He offered the only acceptable, and as the author of Hebrew tells us, the final, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And for us, Christ removed the curse of Adam. What a tragic thing it is to be an Adam. And what a blessed thing it is to be in Christ. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we say it many times behind many pulpits. We would see Jesus. Help us as we think about Genesis 4 to remember May we also see Adam. May we see Cain. And may we see ourselves. We come to you with filthy rags. The stench of our sin is upon us. The evil of our deeds follows us. We follow Adam and we wander east of Eden, far from our home. But then, in Christ, you lead us all the way back back to our home, back to you, 
And so we say, Abba, Father. And may we say it to the praise and to the glory of your grace. Amen.